Thank you very much for that introduction and thank you for being invited to this, um, this uh, forum. There's nothing more that a, a researcher enjoys than to, uh, talking about his research, especially to a captive audience. So <laughs> just lock that door. No one need to leave. Um, okay, so this is me. Um, and uh, I'd like to sort of draw your attention to this little uh, uh, adage down the bottom there, that to act with nature for a chance of success, and if we act against nature, then we're in for certain failure. And that comes from the World Association of Waterborne Infrastructure. Oops, here we go. Um, this map tends to get waved around at the end of these meetings, and people say to me, well, look, you know, um, what are you talking about? There's always been a lot of mud, and certainly there are. There's a, this is a sketch, I must point out, it's a sketch. It's not a scientific document. It's not scaled. But it does show that there are um, expansive areas of intertidal mudflats way back in 1833. Um, it also uh, shows you the areas that um, were also intertidal areas, where we're standing now, and all the way back up to um, what we saw in a previous um, uh, map was called the Clergyman's Gleave, I believe, from the map from 1832 that we saw. Um, so, yeah, let's not pay too much attention to that, except that um, I would draw your attention to the fact that this, the width of the North Esk years ago was about 300 metres. And so we just use that as a rule of thumb and we can see that there was also uh, a quite a considerable water body there. That's probably about 100 metres wide at low tide. Um, you can see it better in the next one, if it's going to move for me. There we go. So this is actually a navigation chart. It is scaled from a th few years earlier, and these depths here are in fathoms. So you can see that the, um, the minimum depth anywhere through Long Reach there, sorry, through Home Reach, uh, is about one and a half fathoms. And if anyone remembers back from pound shillings and pence, that was uh, I think nine feet, about three metres in depth. So. Um, take home message for all, any of this is that there's always been a considerable volume of water. Uh, and again, we can see the expansive intertidal areas there. <coughs> Go. Right. Um, there was still plenty of water around in 1890s, even though people were saying, oh, we need a dredge. Um, this is from an ancestor of mine, Captain G.M. Jackson. So the masters of the vessels and other traders on the river were quite competent at finding the depth of water anywhere. He thought it was an absolute affront to his seamanship that um, the people f felt a need to, to actually dredge so he could get around in his ship. Um, sorry, I've got a heap of slides to get through here and this is not working too, terribly well. So, getting back to estuarine science 101, how does an estuary, how does an estuary work? Well, there are many myths associated with of how, how systems work. And many of the processes are counterintuitive and we just cannot bring our knowledge of rivers and plonk it into an estuarine environment and hope that things work out well because they don't. We end up with disaster. So let's have a quick ch chat about an estuary. Well, here's a, a river a, on plan view heading towards the sea over onto the right hand side. And as it hits the tidal part, estuaries tend to expand out. And um, I'm showing it. Uh, expanding out linearly here, our tamer actually expands out parabolically, so it's slightly different to that. I'm just sort of simplifying things a little bit. Um, <coughs> so the volume of water which flows into the estuary from the sea is called a tidal prism. And we can calculate the tidal prism at any section of that tidal section as we come up, up the estuary. Think of it as the volume of water between the low and high tides is, is the easy way to, to think about what a tidal prism actually is. And there's a simple formula which um, connects that tidal prism to the, to the cross-sectional area of the water body that that tidal prism maintains. And for the tamer, that's the formula. And basically, uh, when you think about it, that cross-sectional area that that tidal prism is maintaining is in a zero-sum game with the, with the silt body that's, that's encompassing it. So more of one gives you less of the other. We could almost call that simple equation a silt equation. Um, it's actually known as the O'Brien's equilibrium equation 
and I'll just quickly show this chap O'Brien found that, discovered that relationship way back in 1931. And he wrote a paper, and it was a bit wishy-washy about it. He thought, this, this looks a bit strange. There's no terms in there for sediment runoff or anything like that. And he wasn't sure whether he was, he was on the right track or not. And so it was a, yeah, it was a very wishy-washy paper that he wrote in uh, 1931. He wrote another, his second paper that he wrote was in 1969 after he spent his career sort of looking at this stuff and he said, yep, I was right. All those years ago, I was right. So, yeah, a very interesting thing. Um, so this raises the concept of equilibrium, which I'll just touch on quickly. And we, talk, we sort of heard it mentioned earlier this morning. So a state, as far as an estuary is concerned, then a state of equilibrium is reached when that cross-section area is at the maximum permitted by the tidal prism. Okay? Or the corollary to that is that the silt levels are at its maximum permitted by the tidal prism. Okay, that makes sense to everyone? Oops. Cool, we jumped ahead a bit there. Okay. So, in the North Esk, um, we have lost about a million cubic metres of tidal prism, basically because we've turned the North Esk into a tidal canal. We've, got, we've built these tidal levees around the whole system, and including in where we are now, Invermay, Inveresk, and we've lost about a, cubic a million cubic metres of tidal prism from the upper, upper, upper estuary. And that has resulted in, in excess of 10 million cubic metres of silt being accumulated over the silt belt. And the silt belt I'm talking about basically from here to sort of rose fears. Um, it could be as high as 15, could be as high as 20 million, no one really knows, but um, considerable um, accumulation of silt. So that's what's happened in the North Esk. Here's an example from um, uh, New Brunswick in, in Canada. And this is what happens when you remove the tidal prism from the system. And this is the Petacodiac River. Um, and at, in about 1968, I think, they decided they'd build a, a barrage across this, this system. And this is what happened. It went from this size to this size in very quick time. It's a bit hard to see on that map, so I've, I've coloured it in for you. So this is what this, the estuary used to look like pre-barrage. Reduce the tidal prism down to nothing by putting a barrage in, and that's what happens. And that's what happens basically with any barrage you put into a, into a tidal system. If that was a river, it wouldn't have had any effect. It just would have just continued on the same size. So that's what I'm saying. You can't bring your knowledge of, of riverine systems into an estuarine environment and expect the same results. So what's happened in that, in that example is that the bathymetry has actually migrated downstream. And in fact, in that example, even the curves migrated from the, from the head of the, what was the old estuary. They, they started again mm. at, the, at the base of the barrage and, and this is exactly what happened. You, you sort of plot them one over the top of the other, they sit almost exactly including the curves. It's just quite remarkable. That happened very quickly. Um, it was a very, very turbid system, a lot of sediment in the system, and that happened over a matter of, you know, a handful of years. So, by putting tidal levees uh, into the North Esk, we've, we've sort of created a similar sort of an effect in that our, what's happened is our bathymetry has, has migrated down this way and allowed more silt to accumulate. If we want to remove silt from the system, then what we want to do is try and force this bathymetry in the other direction. Right? So we migrate it upstream. And alternatively, if we're looking at it, uh, we could actually imp improve the flow of the river has a similar sort of an effect, and I'll come back to that in a minute. So this talk is about the North Esk. So this is a generic talk. I need to tailor it to the North Esk. There's been all sorts of um, proposals put forward to increase the um, ways of increasing the tidal prism in the North Esk. And that includes um, putting in little tidal lakes, um, taking out the tidal levees and let the system um, flood on, on spring tides. And I'm just going to show you this one only because um, 
it, uh, it's quite an easy thing to, to model and it's just um, a good example of that bathymetric migration that I was talking about. So here's um, uh, what I call the Vermont spill area. We've got um, up the top there, you've got Mowbray, Ravenswood over this side and uh, Invermay, Inveress, the unis down there. So if you have a look at those dark patches there, you can actually see, and excuse my crude <coughs> drawing here, my crude graphics, there's an old meander system in there. Now if we were to block off um, the river system here and encourage that either by digging it out or, or whatever means possible, send the, the estuary back around that path, would increase its length by about 1.8 kilometres. And in so doing, you increase the tidal volume in the system or the tidal prism. Okay, so how do we model that? Well, uh, so the modelling of it is actually quite simple. Because all we need to do is we go to the point where we're going to put our, our new meander in, and then we've come down here with the courtesy of Google Earth to about 1.8 kilometres down, and we measure that, that width at that point compared to the width that we started with. And we were to in instigate that, that program and let it rip for a while, let it do its natural things, then this width at the 1.8 kilometre mark will eventually migrate to there. Now, we can measure those on Google Earth. We've got to be a little bit careful doing that because the widths vary considerably. So as part of my thesis, I actually developed a little width equation um, just smooths out the bumps a little bit. <laughs> um, so we can plug some numbers into this equation. For instance, if we were interested to see what the effect of that particular strategy would be at the seaport, well, I can tell you the seaport in that, uh, in that model is at a distance of 11 kilometres. So we plug that into our formula and at the moment the width at, at mid-tide out here is about 70 odd um, metres in width. If we were to make that add our 1.8 kilometres onto that, then our width would, would eventually end up at 94. So we've got a, it, this potentially in excess of 20 metres of extra channel width available if we were to just uh, implement that one project. Same, so we can do the similar sort of things to um, various other projects that are, that are in the pipeline, and these are the smaller lakes. So rather than you use the additional width, we go to a point we just add the tidal prism of the particular lake to where we are at the moment, come down the system to where that tidal prism exists at the moment, and again, we, we migrate our bathymetry accordingly. So that, it is quite a simple thing to, uh, to, um, to model. So the question is, if we were to increase the tidal prism, say, I don't know, 10%, then we can expect to see velocities increase a similar amount. And the question is, is that additional velocity sufficient to erode that much silt? And the question is, well, the answer is, well, probably not, maybe, perhaps. You know? <laughs> um, but I'm going to duck over to the southeast now because it's, it does uh, provide some clues on how we would, that, that erosion would actually occur. So we know that extra flow down the Cataract Gorge, for instance, removes silt um, from the yacht basin. And um, this data from the LFA this line is the fluctuation in, in silt levels. This one here is the 2006 flood, 16 flood. Um, the band over to the left there is times of uh, dredging. These black lines here are the raking. These blue lines here are the flows down the South Esk. So you can see that uh, when the silt um, is reducing in volume is, is uh, during or slightly after these flood events. So, Basically what's happening in, f in terms of di um, uh, the, the equilibrium of the system is that between events the, sud the, this, the sediment returns and it, and it comes back to what I'm calling this existing equilibrium level here. J uh, after, during and after floods that equilibrium position changes and this, you can consider this whole bar sort of on a spring if you like fluctuating uh, over time. So. As I said, in the South Esk, we could, we could actually make the, the system um, larger. We can't, there's not much we can do about sort of um, increasing the tidal prism. Um, so what would happen? Well, 
If we were to uh, visualise superimposing this water body or this water body, that's the uh, water body of Hatspin, and there's, there's no coincidence that those two water bodies are of a similar size because they're carrying the similar sort of volumes of water. So if we were to uh, superimpose that over the top of a yacht basin, then as a back of the envelope calculation, we could expect to see about a removal of about 135,000 cubic metres of silt over that, um, uh, that, that area that we're interested in. And we'll create a new equilibrium position here on our chart. Now, at that point, um, at that point there, the system looked pretty good. Yeah? And any one of these points here, that's, that's a, a pretty good result. But the bottom line is, it's the, it's the floods that did the removal of the silt. The, the project creates a new equilibrium position beyond which the silt cannot return. Okay, so the mechanism, even though we haven't got a, a huge increase in, in velocity from our project, we will eventually get to that new equilibrium position. Um, so in conclusion, We've turned the North Esk into a tidal canal and we've lost this huge tidal prism as a result and the redirection of the Trevallon Dam has caused issues in the South Esk. And so the, the solutions, we need to improve the, the equilibrium position where we can, undo, we can undo and mitigate the changes where possible. Floods will do the work for us and the increased base flow slash tidal prism will prevent the silt returning beyond an equilibrium position. The bottom line is, let the nature do the work for you. And that's what we're looking for. That was 2003 when the dam was emptied. Photo taken by Jeff Smedley from his backyard. The whole up the estuary looked like the Mediterranean. <laughs> it was quite amazing. And that's me. Done.